Hello, thanks for listening to today's message from Calvary in Lake Havasu. This is the final message of our look at Galatians focused on fruitful living. Our scripture reference for today's sermon is Galatians chapter 6, verses 11 through 16. You can download the Life Notes now by visiting calvaryaz.com forward slash life notes. Now, here is Pastor Chad Garrison. invite you to take a seat and grab your Bible or your Bible app and turn to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6 is our text today and we're actually going to be finishing our uh, study in the book of Galatians and so we're going to be looking towards the end of that Galatians chapter 6 verses 11 through 16 and uh, and if you are here or if you are at any of our campuses or uh, or joining us on well join you can't if you're joining us online then that doesn't work but if you're any of our campuses and you don't have a bible and you want to follow along with us there are bibles in the seats around you grab one of those and turn to page 1158 page 1158 you'll be able to follow along with us as we look at Galatians chapter 6 and as always if you're in any of our campuses Parker Campus, North Campus, here at Sweetwater, at McCulloch. If you're at any of our campuses and you don't have a Bible and you want one, then please take one. It is our gift to you. We want you to have God's Word, read God's Word, because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. If you're joining us online and you don't have a Bible and you want one, message us. We'd be glad to get you a Bible one way or another. And you can uh, message a service host right now or you can email us at calvaryaz.com. Dot com. And, and uh, for those of you that are, that are paying attention right now, you can tell this is a little bit different because I have friends that are going to help me share tonight. I'm going to introduce them to you in a moment. And, uh, but right now, I just want to let you know uh, or ask you, what is the one thing about your life that you are most proud of? Not including your kids or your grandkids, okay? I know some of you are groaning right now. You go, I wanna, that's what I'm most proud of. No, something you've accomplished, you've attained, you've become. Because we're asking the question today, what are you boasting about? What are you boasting about? Where is your pride, your joy expressed in your life? Uh, Because the Apostle Paul addresses this subject in our text. So Galatians chapter 6, beginning at verse 11, the Apostle says, See with what large hands I am writing to you with my own hand. Usually he's dictating to someone else. So he takes the pen and he's writing it himself. He says, it is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. So just a couple of things before we get to uh, our guest and uh, sharing. And that is that Paul addresses the vanity of boasting in the flesh. Did you guys catch that? I mean, he's, he's talking about it, none of this stuff matters. Keeping religious rules of circumcision don't matter at all. In fact, in Philippians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul says, nothing compares to the value of knowing Christ Jesus as Lord. And he talks about, you know, all of his achievements, and he says all that stuff is garbage compared to knowing Jesus. It's just waste. It's nothing. So whatever we achieve is meaningless apart from Jesus. Let me say that again. Whatever we achieve is meaningless apart from Jesus. Uh, King Solomon, who scripture tells us was the wisest man ever, says, vanity, vanity, all is vanity. You can put the word meaningless there or futility there. Uh, It doesn't matter because what he's saying is it doesn't matter. What you do doesn't matter. Now, Solomon didn't know Jesus. He didn't know Jesus was coming. He didn't know that. So, you know, I would say it's all meaningless apart from Jesus. So our education, our success, our wealth, our popularity, our achievements, even our religious purity is meaningless compared to the value of knowing Jesus. By the way, that's why our mission is to lead people to a life-changing relationship with? Oh, glad you guys know that, so that's good. (laughs) See, secondly, Paul is boasting in the cross of Christ. Paul's boasting was in the cross of Christ. Did you hear that in verse 14? This is the one you ought to mark in your Bibles. He says, far be it from me to boast 
except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Uh, Paul's boasting because Jesus had saved him by grace. Paul is boasting that God allowed him to serve him as an apostle. If you don't know Paul's story, then uh, just I'll give you a piece of it. He says in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. So he was trying to put Christians to death when he met Jesus in a miraculous way. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, he says, The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And listen to this. He says, Of whom I am the worst. Paul said, I'm the worst sinner. Uh, it's only, the only reason he boasts is the grace of God that saved him and the privilege of serving Jesus. Paul's boasting was in the cross of Christ. And I want us to spend the remainder of our time boasting in Jesus. Okay, boasting in Jesus. I want you to hear some stories of life change from people who unashamedly boast in Jesus. So next to me is Daryl Warren. He is uh, our prayer pastor here at Calvary. You may or may not know him. Serves part-time and uh, yeah. Uh, apparently some people know you. Uh, or they don't, they're applauding anyway. Uh, next to him is Stephanie McDowell, and Stephanie is from our Parker campus, and she's our Woman's Life leader in Parker. Shout out in Parker. And next to Stephanie is Jamie Morris, who obviously is one of our worship leaders. I think you just saw her on stage. And she's also kind of a personal champion of sobriety and life change. Uh, that's my title. So... Let me ask you this. Uh, just share your story of why you boast in Jesus. Daryl, you want to go first? Hi, everyone. Once again, my name is Daryl. And, you know, my story wasn't always about boasting in Jesus. It was actually about boasting in myself. Hmm. I grew up um, in a very affluent neighborhood with some of you that are old enough with Ike and Tina Turner's kids and Ray Charles's kids were my best friends. I mean, like, very close. Every day after school, that's where I went. But that's also where I got um, introduced into drugs, was through Ike Turner um, at about 15 years old, uh, snorting his cocaine, running his recording studio. Um, at 16 years old, we were out of control as kids. They were off in Europe doing their thing, and we were doing ours. And from snorting cocaine, it just continued to spiral out of control. And mind you that I was born and raised in the church, okay? I knew who Jesus was because my parents took me to church every Sunday until I was old enough to say no. And that was the worst mistake I ever made was when I said no because that's when my life completely started to spiral out of control. I mean, out of control to the point to where uh, snorting cake, cocaine came down to now smoking cocaine, smoking crack, which really took my life in directions I never thought would ever happen. You know, I had older brothers that went in that direction. I said, never me. Um, these things wouldn't happen, but it did. It happened nevertheless, and I could not control it. I could not stop it. I tried very many ways, said I'd only do it on the weekends, every other day, but that never worked. It never worked, okay? I always did it every day. Um, I stole from my parents, I stole from you, I stole from whoever I could that were my friends. I wasn't stealing from strangers because I was always afraid of what they would do to me, so I would steal from my friends because I figured they wouldn't do much to me if they caught me. But as my life continued to spiral out of control, um, having crack cocaine in my life, I knew that the only way I was going to overcome this was going to be through Jesus Christ. And I thank my mom for laying that foundation for me of having Jesus in my life at an early age. Even though I walked away, I knew, I knew without a doubt, if I was ever going to stop using crack cocaine, that I would need Jesus in my life. So as I'm getting high and smoking crack, I'm praying at the same time. I'm praying that God will one day take this away from me without blowing my heart out, without giving me a stroke, without me dying, without anything of that nature happening. And it was in that fact where, and I was even coming here to have a suit. A lot, partying with boats and jet skis. And I was that wild guy down in the channel, okay? You, you see him out there today, okay? But he's not me. That's the good thing. <laughs> so, so, you know, and, um, and I can just remember God speaking to me back then. 
um, saying to me, you know, I, I know how much you love boating and you will come back here to Havasu, but you won't come back in the frame of mind that you're in now. And I thought this would never happen because I lost the jet skis, I lost the boat, I lost the home, I lost the wife, I lost everything, you know. But then I got introduced to Jesus completely. A very close pastor friend of mine came to my house unexpectedly with the same name as my drug dealer. I thought it was my drug dealer. And <laughs> yeah, that's a whole story in itself. Um, but yeah, I answered the door thinking it's my drug dealer. It's not. It's Pastor Danny instead of drug dealer Danny. And um, I didn't go over very well because Pastor Danny knew me, and he looked at me, and he said, you need help. And about a month or so after that, he introduced me to another pastor that invited me into a discipleship group, which was going to last for one year, and I had to sign a contract. And for the first 30 days of that, I was still using after I'd signed the contract. And this other pastor friend came by and he said to me, um, hey, Daryl, you were supposed to show up. You signed a contract. What's going on? Uh, this is your chance to get to know who Jesus Christ is. So I'll never forget this. And as I close my story, um, I didn't do very well in school and I never really studied. I didn't know how to study. And he gave me this um, this life study Bible, and he gave me Dallas Willard, Renovation of the Heart, a laptop for my lesson, and I'm sitting there and just not knowing what to do. So I prayed, and I asked for the Holy Spirit to lead me and to guide me, and that happened at 3 o'clock in the afternoon on a Saturday, and at 2 o'clock in the morning, I'm still sitting at that table, and I'm understanding it, I'm getting it, and I'm bawling, I'm totally in tears, because that was my transitional period. I laid down the crack pipe. I never picked it back up again. Amen. <laughs> so, so with that, um, that was the transitional time was when I learned to surrender. Because before, I wanted to have one foot in the world and one foot with God. Because I didn't want to leave that party life. But I learned that when I left that party life, that's when the real party began. Yeah. And so now, now you're in Havasu and you're serving Jesus instead of serving Satan. Yes. Praise God. Yes, That's praise an God. That's awesome story. Amen for that. Amen. Uh, well, hey, thanks for sharing your story. Uh, Stephanie, can you tell us uh, why you boast in Jesus? Hello, everyone. My name is Stephanie. Um, I grew up in Parker, and I actually grew up in the church. Um, and I was being taught about God, but I didn't really have a relationship with God. Um, it was really hard for me to trust or believe um, in him at all. In my home life, um, my father was an alcoholic, um, and there was a lot of abuse going on. And at the age of eight, I was sexually abused by an uncle. Um, we just didn't really talk about those types of things. Even when I came to someone to ask for help, um, I didn't receive it. So that was the time that I kind of decided, you know what, I'm going to create my own life, my own way. Um, from the abuse, I just had so much shame in me. Um, I just felt so much guilt. I felt so much anger. I had so much depression. Um, and that kind of led me into codependency, trying to create my own way by being the perfect mom, being the, the perfect wife, um, trying to be perfect at my job, trying to be the perfect friend, and it was exhausting. And it led me into an addiction with diet pills just to keep the energy that to uphold all these masks that I was carrying. Um, I would pray a lot to God. We had a love-hate relationship. I just couldn't understand why. I would always ask him, why did you create me for abuse? Is this, is this why you created me? I don't understand this. Like, everyone's teaching about how loving and kind you are, and I, I just couldn't receive it. So my place of surrender came in 2010. Um, my mom passed away. Um, my car was totaled. I lost my job, I lost my friends. And I also remember just getting the keys to the condo with my two kids. I also went through my second divorce at this time, and it was very abusive. And I just remember telling God, I can't do this anymore, I'm so exhausted. And I quit cold turkey, um, the diet pills, and I just remember praying to him that if I didn't wake up, 
that my kids would be better off, and it was the lowest point of my life. Um, through that time, I mean, it was, it didn't just happen right away that I turned to, toward him. I was like, God, I don't know how to do this. Like, you've got to just meet me right where I'm at, and I hope you have a good counselor because I'm really messed up. <laughs> and slowly but surely, um, he started whispering in my ear that he wanted me to go back to our church. And it wasn't so much about the church, but it's where I found my relationship with him. Um, there was a mentor that I met there that showed me love, um, the emotional love that I needed. I, I was seeking that so badly. I just felt so unlovable, like I was completely broken. Um, all the abuse had just destroyed me. I, I just didn't know how to let anybody in to be in that place. And he started with her. And she had such a love for God and loved serving him. And I just couldn't understand it. I was like, your life looks so boring. I don't want my life to look like that. And, um, you know, he just met me in that place. It didn't matter. And um, she did too. And she invited me to my first retreat. And I started to learn about how God felt about abuse. I mean, it's, it's throughout the Bible, and, and he hates it. And little by little, just knowing that he understood and could see um, allowed me to open my heart little by little to start trusting him more and more. Um, then I started serving, um, which has been amazing. And I continue to just seek intimacy with him. The more I get to know him and who he is, I want to become more like him. But I also know his character of how much he loves me. And that's going to be until I die, that process. I, I continue to seek intimacy with him. So you asked me what I boast about, and he literally saved my life. I, I don't want to live in this world without him. Um, I continue to heal every day. Um, I'm surprised I'm not bawling my eyes out because I never thought I would be up here sharing my testimony um, and having the courage to do that. But honestly, there were so many people around me when I was going through um, the beginning of my healing journey that gave me hope that I could get better. Um, and I just want to honor and serve God in, in the way that he's asked me to do. Oh, thank you so much for sharing your story. Yeah. Yeah. So, Jamie, what do you, tell us about why you boast in Jesus. Uh, my name's Jamie. Jamie. Um, so I was born in Southern California in the 80s um, into a biker family. Um, there was a, a massive party lifestyle, um, a lot of drinking, um, some violence in our home. Um, and so, you know, going through that all those years of my childhood, uh, my parents moved us to Parker when I was about 10 years old. And by the time I got into high school, um, I was uh, fairly promiscuous, and um, I found myself partying, um, drinking at friends' houses. Um, I really started to live that party lifestyle, which I didn't think was um, necessarily a bad place to be because I watched my parents party a lot, um, and so it just felt kind of natural uh, to do that. Um, I was at a friend's house um, at a party one evening, and I was physically injured. And right after that, um, a doctor in Parker, our family doctor, started prescribing me um, large amounts of opiate medications. Um, and at the time, they, they weren't talking about the addictive properties in these medications. I can remember the doctor actually saying that this particular medication was kind of a substitute for the addictive ones. Um, but I noticed fairly quickly that it gave me the opportunity to escape. Um, I, I didn't feel the physical pain anymore, but more importantly, I didn't feel the emotional um, pain anymore. Um, and so I found myself um, taking a lot of them all the time. So um, as time progressed, I was stuck in that opiate addiction. I was doctor seeking. I was lying about injuries. Um, I was driving to other cities and other counties uh, to visit ERs to receive what I needed. And um, and in that time, I, I was still... Uh, the type of girl that was looking for the father who didn't give me love. And so I was seeking out these different men. And um, I had uh, three children by three men, two marriages, two divorces. Um, life was a mess. Um, and um, I continued to spiral. And my opiate, my opiate addiction led me into um, an intravenous uh, heroin and meth addiction. So I was using with the needle. And um, I, by that time, I gave up 
my home, my cars, my family, my children. Um, I had lost every personal item that ever existed attached to me. Um, and in 2018, October of 2018, I experienced an almost fatal overdose um, on the north side of town. And the person that I was with rushed me to the hospital where a nurse here at our Havasu Hospital um, administered a drug called Narcan and saved my life. Um, I was not happy that she saved my life. Um, I was uh, miserable. I felt like they had brought me back to homelessness, to being a mother without her children, to being heavily physically addicted to drugs that I was, at this point, what I felt was using against my own will because I didn't want to use anymore, but I couldn't stop myself. Um, and I would love to tell you that that was the end of that addiction for me, but I was a drug addict. And so um, I continued on. I, I got into recovery for about seven months, and then I had uh, one more almost fatal overdose. Um, I was living in Kingman, Arizona, um, in a little single-wide trailer, and I had been attending church, you know, and I had been going to 12-step recovery meetings, and, and I thought I was seeing it, um, and then I had this relapse again. And I just remember being on the bathroom floor and just crying out to God, just like begging him to please save me from myself because I had tried and I didn't understand what I wasn't seeing to actually change my life. I had done this over and over and I wasn't figuring it out. And so I just begged God to please save me. Um, and I, and I asked him, you know, I, I told him that he could have my children and my dad and all the pain and my career and, like, I would just give it all to him if he would just help me. Um, and I, I promised him that if he did that for me that I would surrender and I would serve him and I would tell people. <laughs> and uh, sometimes I think he gave me my story because he knew I have a loud mouth and I would tell a lot of people. <laughs> um, and, and I did. You know, I decided in that moment... I. I when they talk about the road to Damascus, you know, and the scales being removed from the eyes, I will tell you this, for the first time in my entire life, when I came up off of that bathroom floor and exited the bathroom, I could see more clear than I ever had in my entire life. I could see that I was the problem. No one else was the problem. I was the problem. And if I was going to change it, I needed to recognize that and then get to work. And so I did. I, I just had this like crazy resolve to commit to recovery no matter what it took. And I was going to take every suggestion my sponsors had offered me before that I was like, nah, I don't want to do that one. I'll do these, but I don't want to do that one. And this time I was like, no, I'm doing it all. I'm going to take every suggestion. And, um, you know, because of that and giving my life to the Lord the way that I chose to that day on the bathroom floor, I've gained so many things in my life. I mean, I don't deserve to hold a microphone in a church on a stage. If you're looking at my past, you know what I mean? I don't belong up here holding a microphone or singing or any, but God uses the messy and the broken, right? He's given me the career back behind the chair where I get to share my story with Sometimes like first time customers that are like, whoa. But then, <laughs> but then right afterwards, it's like, oh, I have a daughter that's addicted to heroin, yeah. you know? And I get to have those hope filled conversations with people. You know, I gained an amazing husband who walks with the Lord. My two older children back in my life, which I never thought was possible and God brought them to my doorstep in a, in a snap, you know? And I'm, I'm still, thank you, yeah. I'm still waiting for my third son, but something I've learned in walking with the Lord these last few years is that his time is better than mine. And it's just my job to just keep being the woman that he has turned me into today. And when my son comes knocking, I'll be the mom that he deserved to have his whole life. And then I can just start from there, you know? And so I just get to be this person today, this person I never thought I could be. What a, it's a gift. It's a hey, gift. Amen. That is a wonderful boast in Jesus. Yeah. Hey, uh, you know what, I, I, want, I want to join with you guys in boasting in Jesus as well, uh, because uh, I grew up in the church, and I grew up, uh, I trusted Jesus at eight years old, uh, but by the time I was 16, uh, I didn't like who I was, uh, because I didn't achieve anything I wanted to achieve. Uh, I know at 16, it's like, what are you supposed to achieve? But I wanted to be an athlete, and God didn't make me with a body for an athlete, and uh, <laughs> And I wanted to be a singer, uh, and, uh, and I worked really hard to be able to carry a tune in a bucket. <laughs> Keep that thing away. And, uh, and believe it or not, I grew up in the time of disco, and all the people I hung out with, they were all dancing, and I wanted to be able to dance, you know, like John Travolta. And, uh, and God created me without a single bit of rhythm, okay? <laughs> I'm just telling you right now, the hips are attached all the way to the floor and to the ceiling. <laughs> And, uh, and I can't keep a beat unless I'm watching someone else clap, okay? 
So, uh, uh, you know, it, and so all of these things were just failures. And, it, and by the time I was 16, I didn't like who I was. And, and you know, all your stories, you hit bottom, uh, and that bottom looks different for all of us. And mine was 16 years old at a youth camp, and, uh, you know, I was a loser in my own youth group. So uh, it says a lot. But, uh, but I prayed and said, God, I don't like me, but you love me, and you can have control of my life. And everything good in my life, uh, my wife, my kids, my grandkids, uh, this church, the ministry, the privilege of serving God is because of Jesus and his grace. And, and so I want to join you guys in boasting in Jesus and leading to uh, the second question that I want to ask you real brief. So what is the one thing, what is the one realization or truth or awareness that propelled you to this life change and this place where you're living for Jesus today. What is that one thing, Jamie? You have to start with me. Um, it's, I think for me, um, it's definitely the realization that, that um, I am not a victim, that the world is not out to get me, and that it is not the judge's fault or my probation officer's fault or the police fault or my kid's dad's fault for taking them. It was, for me, that removal of the scales from my eyes and God saying, okay, look, I'm going to give you the problem very clearly um, because without recognizing the problem, I can't seek a solution, right? And, um, and I had sought solutions out in the world all the time. All the things, boys, drugs, drinking, partying, all the things, and none of that was fixing it. Homes, careers, none of it. Um, and so I, I think for me, the recognition that every single thing I had tried for decades was not filling the God-sized hole that existed in my heart. And so for me, it was that. It was that realization that no one else is the problem, it's me, and now it's time to seek the solution, which we know is Jesus. Amen, so. amen. Stephanie, how about you? Um, for me, it'd be the realization that um, I am the daughter of the Most High King, and he loves me and values me and um, just has a purpose for my life. I, the realization also that I don't want to live in this world without him, and I couldn't. I don't want to. Um, he has the best plan for my life, and I can trust him, and he knows best. Amen. Amen. Daryl, what's that one thing in your life what, that propelled you to who you are today? I would have to say that is when I started the ordination class for the one year, the biggest thing that propelled me was me being willing to surrender. Mm. So that was the word for me was surrender. Because as I noticed when I surrendered, it, I felt like God continued to come closer and come closer. And not only did it become closer, but I mean, look at today. I'm here in Havasu, right? I'm not on drugs. I even became an ordained minister. Who would have thought? Like Jamie said, you know, like being up here on the stage, having a microphone, uh, being an ordained minister, who would have thought? I just want to say this in ending. You know, one of the greatest things I said was surrender. And I got to be with my mom here in Havasu right before she passed. And two weeks before she passed, I got to look at her. And I got to tell her, thank you for introducing me to Jesus as a child. It's because of that that I had that foundation and I knew what to go back to when I was in my struggle. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, I appreciate all of you sharing. Uh, and, and so we want to ask you, what are you boasting about? Can you boast in this life-changing experience with Jesus? You've heard them tell their stories, but what about your story? It, it, have you come to that place where you have confessed Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Have you come to that place where you believe that he died on the cross for your sins and was raised from the dead and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus? You've surrendered to him? Now, if you haven't done that yet, we want to invite you to do that tonight. We invite you to do that today, that, that uh, you would just decide that you're going to follow Jesus no matter what. You're going to give him control. You're going to stop being afraid. You're going to stop having one foot in the world and one foot following Jesus. And, and if you've never made that decision, then you can do it today. You can, you know, come and talk to the prayer team after the service. Uh, several of these will be up here uh, also if you want to come and talk to them. 
uh, just to, uh, to answer questions and pray with you. You can come find a pastor out in the foyer or you can just fill out a connect card and say, hey, I wanna talk to someone about following Jesus. We wanna help you experience that life-changing relationship with the Son of God and Savior of the world. But if you do have a relationship with Jesus, then what's your story look like? Are you boasting in Jesus? And if you've never shared your story and you want to, then uh, call the church office, make an appointment with one of the pastors or leaders, and we would love to hear your story and help you boast in our Savior. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for the way that you love us, for the way that you change us. Thank you for stories of redemption and hope. Thank you for taking our sins upon yourself and paying the price for our rebellion, paying the price for our self-destruction. We know that all of our hope, all of our forgiveness, all of our life is wrapped up in the person of Jesus and that we are hopeless and helpless without him. We have no hope of eternal life apart from Jesus. We have no hope of that strength to experience that life-changing relationship apart from Jesus. And so today we just praise you for Jesus. And God, we ask that you would reveal yourself to us, that we would uh, hear your voice, we would sense your presence, and you would give us the courage to follow Jesus with our whole heart. It's in his name we pray, amen. Boasting is typically an indication of pride, but like Paul, we should boast about the cross of Christ and how Jesus has saved us from eternal damnation. If we must boast, let our boasting be about Jesus. We would love to learn more about you, and we invite you to connect with us by filling out an online connect card. There are two ways to get there. You can scan the QR code on the screen or visit calvaryaz.com forward slash connect. One of our pastors will contact you, get to know you, and pray with you. Well, that's all for today. Come back next week to learn more about the values of Calvary. Bye-bye.